Hi, I'm Chris from Practical Navigator. So far in this series, we've learned how to transfer radar contacts to paper and a little bit about how the radar actually works. In this episode, we'll learn about closest point of approach and how it can help you make collision avoidance decisions. What is closest point of approach? It's simply the closest that a contact gets to you in the center of the maneuvering board. It has a bearing, a range, and a time. Let's start with the contact from the last episode. Obviously, the CPA range is zero and the bearing is 190, but let's calculate the CPA time. To do that, we need to find out how quickly the contact is moving down the relative motion line, and we'll use the nomogram to help us out. We can measure that the contact traveled 2 nautical miles in 12 minutes, so we put the tick marks at the appropriate places on the nomogram. Then it's just a matter of connecting the dots to find the contact's speed of relative motion. This is not the speed of the vessel, just how quickly it appears to be moving down the relative motion line. Then we note how far the contact still has to travel and work backwards up the nomogram to find the time that the contact will take to cover that ground. 48 minutes in this case. Plenty of time to make a radio call. What about our other contact from last episode? Let's figure out its speed of relative motion using the same technique we just learned. By noting the distance the radar contact traveled in a given time period, we obtain an SRM, or speed of relative motion, of 8 knots. Good to know. We can also easily obtain the direction of relative motion, just like last episode, but it is an intermediate step in the process. So what about the bearing and range to CPA? The easiest way to get this data is to find the perpendicular line from the origin to the relative motion line and note the bearing and range. This is the closest point of approach, or CPA, and it is something your captain will ask. Next, let's get the time to CPA. A quick and dirty way of determining the time to CPA is to walk your dividers down the relative motion line. If the measured distance is 12 minutes, you can just add 12 minutes for each spread of the dividers. However, it is not as accurate as using the nomogram. Using the nomogram should be easy since we've already determined the speed of relative motion. We just have to work upwards, noting the distance the contact has remaining to cover before CPA. Twenty-four minutes in this case, making CPA 0136. Now it's time to calculate the contact's actual course and speed, and we need to use more vectors. Going forward, we want to be consistent in our labeling, so we'll refer to the speed triangle. This is just a triangle with the apexes E, R, and M. E to R is the own ship's course and speed. R to M is the relative motion line of the contact. E to M is the contact's true course and speed. The triangle can take many shapes, but these are the three legs that you must know. So far we've dealt in the relative motion world of the maneuvering board, but now we're heading deep into the theoretical vector world. While the relative motion line is where the contact actually is, now we'll use the maneuvering board to calculate its true course and speed. So the first thing we'll do is plot our vector, E to R, representing our true course and speed. Next, we need to plot the relative motion vector. You could measure from the center, but most often we just parallel the actual relative motion line to the point R. Be sure to draw the relative motion vector in the same direction as the relative motion line, from M1 towards M3. A common mistake is to draw the line backwards. How long do we draw it? An equivalent distance to the speed of relative motion line, which we said was 8 knots for this example. We can label that point M, and whatever is left, the vector E to M, is the contact's true course and speed. The course is equal to the bearing of the EM vector, and the speed is equal to the length of the EM vector. Now we not only know where the contact is and where it's going relative to us, we know its true course and speed so we can determine its orientation and apply the rules of the road. 
In this case, there is no risk of collision, so we're good to go. If it isn't apparent to you, you can always draw your own ship. And then parallel the EM vector to the contact's last position and draw a little boat to help you visualize. Always remember the line of relative motion is the line the contact will continue to travel down if neither ship changes its vector, regardless of the true courses and speeds. So now that we've done a couple of academic examples, let's get to a real example and see how you would actually do this on the bridge of a cutter. So from soup to nuts, the first step is to plot your own vector, as well as the contact's positions. We're going to use a 2 to 1 scale in this case. Once we have three positions, we can draw the line of relative motion and determine the direction of relative motion and the speed of relative motion using the nomogram. Immediately apparent is that the contact will cross our bow and have a CPA of about two miles. We'll skip the time to CPA in this case so we can focus on getting the true course and speed. That will tell us what type of maneuvering situation we're in. Next, we parallel the relative motion line to R and draw it a distance equal to the SRM. The leftover vector E to M is the contact's true course and speed. If it helps you, you can draw the little ships, but hopefully you can see that this contact will pass ahead of you at slightly over 2 miles, so there is not any risk of collision. If your standing orders are different, and both ships are power-driven vessels inside of one another, you would be in a crossing situation and you would be the giveaway vessel. If you'd like some more practice, try the following examples. In this episode, we've learned how to calculate closest point of approach and course and speed data for a single contact. In the next episode, we'll learn how to either avoid or intercept that contact.